Hi, and welcome to the show. Subscribe at kevinandre.com slash podcast. Get CME for this episode by clicking on the CME links in the show note. Today, we welcome back Alan Lindemann. He's an obstetrics gynecology physician. His Kevin MD article is titled, Unveiling the Hidden Damage, the Secretive World of Medical Boards. Alan, welcome back to the show. Thank you, Kevin, very much. Happy to be here. So we'll get into your article in a little bit, but for those who didn't listen to our first episode together, just briefly share your story and journey to where you are today. I grew up in a small town in North Dakota. I'm a high school dropout who became an associate clinical professor at the University of North Dakota and the AHEC director for one quarter of the state for teaching family practice doctors, obstetrics, and gynecology. All right. So let's talk about your Kevin Henry article. We'll jump right into it. Unveiling the Hidden Damage, the Secret of World of Medical Boards. Now, how did this article come together? Well, unfortunately, I have experience with a medical board. I had COVID, Delta COVID in September of 21, and I wasn't very sick with it, stayed home, but I was tired and weak and dizzy. So I worked for a while, didn't realize how tired I was, but because I was weak and dizzy, um, I was accused of being drunk. I was not drunk. I was tested for 14 things and they were all negative. But essentially, I was fired from my job because I was physically ill with COVID. And the board, the North Dakota board, then took my license, my North Dakota medical license, because of the physical illness associated with COVID. So yes, I have that experience, unfortunately, with the medical board. So tell me the events leading up to those tests, like how did people know that you were suspected to be drunk? Well, like I said, I was dizzy and weak. And so I really did have a hard time walking straight. If I turned quickly, I would need to brace myself on the wall with my hand so I wouldn't lose my balance. And yes, they said I was slurring my speech and not finishing my sentences. So, but I never got an official warning and I never got anything in writing. I was never actually told why I was being fired. Now, did someone report you? Did someone observe you in the state? There were, there was a physician, another physician there who did see me apparently. I didn't know she had been watching me trying to walk and with my balance problems. But I was called into the CEO's office and she was there and they said, oh, well, if you're drunk, we're going to fire you right now. So they walked me out. Then they later came to my house and tested me for the 15 things, including alcohol. And of course, every single thing was negative. I was then sent to a neurologist who said I was completely neurologically normal. They actually hired me back, but the environment was very hostile and they fired me a second time. I wrote a letter to the hospital staff here and to the board, the local board, certified letters, because that's how it's supposed to happen. I'm supposed to get a warning, a written warning. I'm supposed to get two weeks to do better. And if I don't, then we go to the hospital board here. And then they decide to fire me or to hire me or to do something else. So anyway, because none of that happened, I sent letters, certified letters to the board that made the CEO very angry. So then he sent his letter to the medical board with seven complaints, which he had conspired to make. In other words, all these things were done after the fact. So... <laughs> Yeah, it's been a little recovery time, but in a way, it's given me time to do other things, which I enjoy doing, like writing. So who made the diagnosis that your symptoms were related to COVID? And when you presented those facts, how were they received? Well, ironically, the doctor here who accused me of being drunk, when she wrote a letter to the medical board, said that I had long-term COVID. 
So the medical board had that information from the very beginning. They just didn't act on it. During this ordeal, did you have legal representation? Did you have someone yes, to did. speak on behalf of you to, to, to help protect you from these accusations? I did have a lawyer. And we, as a matter of fact, the day I was first accused of being drunk, we called my lawyer and the lawyer said, tell the truth. So that was what got me in trouble was telling the truth. And anyway, she was there through all of it. Eventually ended January of this year, January of 2023. Now tell us about your interactions with the medical board. Well, that's, I think, the sad thing right now. Two things stick out. One is that I had five days to respond to those letters. So that's really not due process. You know, there's supposed to be several weeks or months for me to respond to the accusations, which in this case were largely false. There was never any evidence of patient harm. As a matter of fact, the letters written didn't say anything about patient harm. And it's one of the things the board is supposed to act on is patient harm. If there's no harm, they shouldn't be acting. But again, I was, the letters made me sound dangerous. So they gave me five days to respond. And of course, we really couldn't respond in five days. Now, when you told your side of the story to the board or when they heard your side of the story, did it have any effect? Well, that's the whole thing. They pretty much shielded themselves from my side of the story. When they gave me five days to respond, they also didn't get my side of the story. So they just pretty much acted on the material they had. In fairness to the board, they did send me to a neuropsychologist. And of course, I, I was tired. I was fatigued anxious, depressed, and angry. So I didn't do well on the test. Although I took, I retook a different test three months later and did much better. But that was really the end of it was that test. And so they made their decision. They said I could reapply in three years, but in three years, I'll be 78. So no, that's not likely to happen. Now, where do you stand now? You're not clinically practicing? No, not now. But my wife and I have written a book. It's called Pregnancy Your Way. And it, the subtitle is Choose a Safe and Happy Birth. And you know, right now we have so much in the news about births that have gone wrong, maternal mortality increasing. So I think the book is hitting the market at the right time. It'll be available August 3rd. Now, if you were to replay this ordeal all over again, as unpleasant it may be, what would you have done differently? Well, I probably would have been more aggressive with my lawyer because, you know, I should have had due process, which I didn't have. And my lawyer should have made sure that I got due process. So, but I was really just incapacitated by this whole thing. It's like getting hit on the head with a two by four. Did your lawyer give any explanation why you didn't receive due process? We didn't talk about due process and I never did get an explanation for the fact that there wasn't due process. Now is your story, is this common? among interactions with medical boards across the country? Well, Kevin, medical boards work both ways. They over-punish some and they under-punish some. We have a lot of information now on the internet about doctors who've been associated with a lot of surgical deaths. And I think a lot of times medical boards are slow to react when it comes to actual physical harm. Again, with me, there was no evidence of physical harm. As a matter of fact, no examples given of physical harm that I caused. As a matter of fact, after they fired me and took my license, two of my patients died. A 33-year-old diabetic 
and a 38-year-old lady who died as a result of DIC from untreated pneumonia. I had been seeing these people for six years and kept them alive. And yes, they were socioeconomically deprived, and some people don't like those patients. I, on the other hand, understand them, and I enjoy have enjoyed giving them a tether, a reason to live. And I think they were missing that. Now, during this ordeal, did you have any support from the physician community? One of the things that happened was, and I'm just learning about this now, I've talked with a couple of the nurses who had to, were forced to write those letters, and they apologized. They said they were afraid of contacting me because they had been threatened by the CEO. So, and no, I didn't have any support from colleagues and I had no support from the nurses. I tried calling one of the nurses one day and unfortunately I was stupid enough to leave a message and they said, call back. You're not supposed to call us here. We don't want to talk to you. So that was the end of that conversation. I knew what was happening. Now for those other physicians who may be in a similar situation to where you were being accused by the hospital and the medical board, what kind of advice do you have for them? Well, I would say, first of all, get a good lawyer, but nothing is going to fix this in the short term. Medical boards do operate in secret, and because everything is secret, for example, their defense for my accusation of not having due process would be to say, oh, well, he did have due process. So, you know, the rights of the individual doctor and actually the rights of the public are just gone. Anything can happen. I would say that the individuals who are accused don't have much opportunity to protect themselves. On the other hand, there are some people that are protected from within. And I'm going to give you an example of that. You know, all medical boards operate in their political. In other words, you get the position on the board by virtue of being appointed by the governor. So it's if you know the governor, which means if you have contributed money to the governor's campaign, you're more likely to get a spot on the board. Big clinics have several spots on the board and they protect themselves. So the example here is a drug dealer. He was making, he had 70 marijuana plants in his basement. Now, most people who were caught with distributing marijuana and other drugs to high school students would go to jail. This doctor got three months in the clinic for drug dependence and then they led him back to an underserved area. It happened to be a birth control clinic, exactly the, the demographic that he was selling his drugs to. Don't know whether he was actually selling there or not. But the upshot is that the judge said, oh, incidentally, the DA's wife worked for this guy's boss. So it was all connected. Anyway, the upshot is this guy got a two-year suspended sentence if he behaved himself for two years, all of this stuff disappeared. And now, the end of the story is that eventually Medicare caught up with him and told the, the clinic that hired him, they said, you cannot hire a felon. So in the eyes of the federal government, he was a felon, but he still got a license from the state until that happened and, and until they made that. And I don't even know what happened to a state license after that, but I do not think any state would be brazen enough to give somebody marked as a federal felon a license. One of the pieces of advice that you mentioned earlier was to get a good lawyer. So what exactly do you mean by that? What kind of legal advice should physicians seek out if they were in similar situations to you? Well, a good lawyer, you don't know really until after everything is said and done, whether your lawyer is, is helping you or not, but they should actually act on your behalf. I know that in certain situations, if you have a friend, for example, 
who has some kind of status and can go to the board and talk to the secretary, that often helps a lot. As a matter of fact, sometimes some of the secretaries that should get into trouble just leave the country. So yes, conversations behind closed doors work pretty well. Unfortunately, that's generally not something that your lawyer is going to do, although it could perhaps be done. And my final question, Alan, tell us some of your take-home messages that you want to leave with the Kevin MD audience. I'd like to see all boards watched. In other words, when these boards are made by the legislature, they are free to act as however they want to act. And they don't answer to anybody. And if they do a lot of damage to the public, they don't, they're not responsible for that. So what I'd like to see is some legislative action that actually creates a body to watch the medical boards and to assess for the damage that they cause to the public, either by their inaction or by their action. Alan, thank you so much for sharing your story, time, and insight. Thanks again for coming back on the show. Thank you, Kevin.